Psalm 1. Psalm 1, the entire chapter. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Good morning. It is so good to see you out today and to the many guests, as Clint has already mentioned in the very beginning, we're glad that you've taken the time to worship with us today. And it is our hope and our prayer uh, that your time spent with us today will be beneficial, uplifting spiritually, as we attempt to serve and worship God and remember his son. Appreciate the reading that Jack has given for us today in the first psalm. There is almost complete unanimity in the authorship, the understanding that the first psalm very much appears to be a psalm of David. There are very, very few that would suggest it was anybody else. But as we look at this psalm, David's first psalm centers on man. And with every line making a reference to him and his ways. The first and last words of the psalm are interesting, especially as we would look at the Hebrew text of which it would have originally been written and then translated into English that almost all, with only a couple of exceptions, of the translations would begin and end the psalm with the two words that depict the two paths of man. And that is blessed, as opposed to the last word of the psalm, perish. We need to be able to see how those two words or concepts stand in contradistinction and, as it were, bookends to the psalm. Blessed is the man, this godly man, that will be described in these first few verses. But not so with the ungodly man, as we see in the final verses, of which concludes that individual will perish. It is here I think we need to examine the psalm and to understand there are two paths and two destinies, and the choice is always ours. This is very descriptive in the psalm of what David is saying. Spiritually speaking, the two individuals that are addressed within the psalm again represent two ways and two ends, two paths or two destinies, and this is what's going to be experienced by all humanity. Now this is a very common theme, especially when we think about the concept of a path. We would see in Scripture over and over in both the Old and the New Testament the emphasis of a path, a way or a road to take, a path. For example, Solomon in his wisdom would state in Proverbs 14 and verse 12 that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's a way or a path that leads to destruction. That is opposed to the way of God. And it is exactly why Jesus warned in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 13, when he says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. 
There you see again the contradistinction. That which is made between the path of the just and the path of the unjust. No wonder Jesus would state emphatically in John chapter 14 to his disciples in verse number 6 of John 14, 6 when he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we understand, brethren, that God has always given man the right to choose for himself which course he wishes to pursue. Clint has very appropriately selected in our consideration of songs for worship and for edification and spiritual consideration in the last song that we have just sung, talking about Joshua. In the very famous, well-known expression of Joshua 24 and verse 15, when he's giving his farewell address to Israel because he knows that the end of his life is drawing near. And as he wants his Israeli brethren to understand, they have a choice to make. And what he says to them in a very challenging way of Joshua 24 and verse 15, he says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served who are on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a beautiful expression, isn't it? And makes for a beautiful song. It's always about choices. Two paths with two destinies, and the choice is ours. God puts that choice into our hands. And so I think it's important for us to carefully examine the two paths, the two destinies, because this is what's going to be contrasted. That in the first half of the psalm, we see in these verses, the way of the righteous man. And then we're going to see the way of the ungodly man. And there will be, again, this contrast that exists between the two. Let's talk about the way of the righteous man. And what we see in verse 1, first of all, what is his life? The life, the way of the righteous man. His life is expressed in this beautiful saying in this verse, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. When you think about this man's life, the way of the righteous man, he understands that his righteousness is directly connected to his relationship with God. That it is not a self-made righteousness. And we appreciate the fact, do we not, that we could never be righteous on our own. That our righteousness is only achieved when we find that righteousness with our relationship, in a relationship with God. And we understand through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, today. But look at this individual. You know what? When you think of these words, and did you see that? He doesn't stand and he doesn't sit. He doesn't do these things. He doesn't walk in these ways of the wicked. He is not afraid to take a stand. And brethren, that's where we need to be. That if we're going to walk in the way, the path of the righteous man, then we must not be afraid to take a stand. The Apostle Paul certainly would remind the Corinthian brethren that they needed to take a stand, that they should not have fellowship with darkness. There is no fellowship between light and dark, between righteousness and unrighteousness. And what does he say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? He says in reference to wickedness and to unrighteousness, he says, come out from among them and do not touch what is unclean. Make a stand, make a clear cut, make a departure from what the world is doing. You see, the way of a righteous man is he recognizes he doesn't want to be like this world. He doesn't want to look like this world and sound like this world, be like this world. This man is willing to make a difference. Again, he's not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He is not going to stand in the path of sinners and he's not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. He's going to dare to be different. He's going to be different. He was going to take a stand and he recognizes he'll have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Take your Bibles and turn over to the New Testament quickly, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And the Apostle Paul says to the brethren there in Ephesus in Ephesians 5 and verse 6, listen to it carefully. He says to these Christians, 
Let no one deceive you with empty words. <clears throat> For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once, notice that's past tense, before they were Christians, for you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and notice verse 11, and have no fellowship, no communion, no partnership, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Brethren, listen, not only are we to have no partnership, no fellowship or communion with that which is darkness and wickedness in this world, not only are we not to fellowship, but we need to expose it for what it is. That's the way of the righteous individual. And the psalmist David says he is blessed or he is happy because of his lifestyle. A clear conscience makes one very happy and produces true satisfaction. But we can only have that clarity of conscience when what? When we're walking with God. If we're not walking with God and we're not walking in the counsel of righteousness, in the counsel of truth, we can't have a clear conscience. And especially Christians recognize that. When we look at his life, his life is demonstrated by who he walks with and who he'll sit with and who he'll converse with as far as being in agreement. His life. But then when we look at the way of the righteous man, and we notice in verse 2, we see what regulates his life. He has this very special life, and the question becomes, what regulates it? I'm going to tell you right now. Why, how we live, the choices we make, everything that we do in this life, the words that we speak, even the thoughts that we think, it's regulated by something. We've got regulators. We do. Now the righteous man, what is it that regulates his life? And verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. I offered a challenge in a sermon last Sunday. Maybe some of you might remember. And I said, how much time do we spend with social media? How much time do we spend in entertainment? How much time do we spend in various things such as that as contrasted or compared to how much time we spend reading the Bible and meditating about God's Word? Is that a challenging question? I think it is. You see, what is it that regulates this righteous man? He is regulated in that he meditates upon the things of God, the law of God, both day and night. He knows the Lord's way. Jesus said in John 8, 32, he says, listen, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's the only thing that can set us free. Free. Why is it? Why is it that Paul acknowledged, even as Luke records in Acts chapter 17, how was it that the Bereans were more noble or fair-minded than those in Thessalonica? Number one, because they received the word of God, how? With all readiness of mind. And then what did they do? Search the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Do you see how that serves as the regulation of the life of a righteous individual? We see his life. We see what regulates his life. And so he sets his mind on godly things. Paul, he certainly deals with that mindset difference in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, he states there to these Christians in Rome, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on what? The things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit do what? Set their minds where? On the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally, that is fleshly minded, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Brethren, it's all about a mindset. Where do we set our minds? What do we allow to regulate the way we think? Because here's the point. I don't care what step we take, what action we take, what word we speak, and again, what thought we may think. Every bit of it's going to be regulated by some kind of influence that begins deep within the mind. And that's why we need to do the best that we possibly can to clear our minds of the unrighteous, the unfruitful works of darkness, but allow our minds to be regulated by the pure 
things of God, those spiritual things of God. He sets his mind on godly things. No wonder, as you know this passage well, we used it as a lectureship theme a few years ago in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's anything virtue, if there's any virtue or anything worthy of praise, meditate on these things. It's a mindset. This is what regulates the way of the righteous man's mind. We look at his life. We look at that regulation that controls or influences him. And then when we notice verse 3, thereby we see the fruits of his life. Because of this well-regulated life that meditates upon the word and the things of God, now we see the fruits of his life, verse 3. He shall be like her as a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Isn't that beautiful? You talk about imagery and metaphor, and yet it is so meaningful. You see, we look at his life, and now because of where his mind is set, notice the fruit of his life, his godly life. And we have to understand this, first of all, that his godly life It defies life's scorching sun and harsh wind because he's firmly planted and well watered, his mind is. In the metaphor that he's using, and I want to ask you, are we faced with storms in life? I ask quite a few, and I'm just going to do this. This is kind of interesting because this is going to be astounding. And play along with me, would you please? If you're visiting... Today, anywhere from the greater San Joaquin Valley. Let me see your hand. Yeah, I, some of them don't want to raise it very high. I understand that. But <laughs> I asked several of you this morning. I said, getting away from the heat and the cubs said, oh, yeah. I mean, it's been a little warm over there, I take it. We have been having to deal with this, this balmy 68 degree weather. But anyway. The point is is that you know what it's like to have to be in the heat. If you have to work in that heat or walk in that heat. And you just want to get away from that. And this is what the psalmist is portraying. He's saying, listen, life has these problems. The sun is beating down on us. And there's that wind, that harsh wind that just wants to influence. And he looks at all these kinds of things. But he says, here's the godly life. And his life, because he is well-rooted, well-planted, and he's allowing his life to be well-watered by the things of God, he can take the heat. He can take the storms, all the difficulties that come. His life, godly life, defies the scorching sun. It defies the harsh wind because he's firmly planted and well-watered. And whatever he does will what? Prosper. Do we see what the psalmist is doing here? Take a look who you are. We want, to be, we want to be righteous people and we want to walk. We want to be in the path of the righteous. And the righteous individual understand where he walks and where he stands and even where he sits. And he's going to take great efforts to stay away from those things that will conflict in a right relationship with God. I love what... God said to the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah had to deal with the children of Israel during very difficult and even rebellious times. That is immediately seen in the first chapter of Isaiah. But in the third chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 3 and verse number 10, here we see that the Lord says to Isaiah, and this is what he wanted Isaiah to pronounce to the people of Israel, Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. The sad thing was, is there were not as many righteous that should have been because so many had rebelled against God. But I look at this as a promising verse that though there are so many people in the world and the world again stands in opposition to God, and then how many times do we find even people of God get sucked in to this opposition against God? But then here are those that are trying to be righteous. And you know what he's saying? Take heart, 
and just keep doing what you need to be doing. Do you see that positive message as well? Keep doing what you're doing. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. The way of the righteous man. But now notice what the psalmist does in the second half of this incredible psalm, this opening psalm. And it is here that he talks about the way of the ungodly man and addresses his life in verse 4, the beginning part of verse number 4. His life, after he has well established the life of this righteous individual in this good relationship with God, then he follows with this in verse 4 by simply saying, the ungodly are not so. Now we know where the righteous man is. We know where he walks, and we know where he stands, and we know where he sits, and we know where he meditates upon day and night, and we know that the fruit of his life is good, positive stuff, right? But verse 4, the ungodly, the way of the ungodly are not so. In other words, his life is the opposite of the righteous. You know, we have a tendency to not want to look at it that way. We have a tendency that we don't always like this, and especially people of the world, well, there's this righteous conduct and behavior that's going to be seen as we are connected to God in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then the Bible, despite and everything else, is not so. Do you know what we like to do? We kind of like to put this more on an analog scale. We just kind of want to put this where almost there's, there's kind of a needle like, oh, here's the way super righteous here. And then over here is the way super wicked. And then somewhere we're kind of in between. Doesn't the world look at a lot of things like that? Do we see how wrong and detrimental it is to look at the Bible that way? Does that make sense to what I just said there? Let me tell you, it's not like that. We understand that what he's, what he's really presenting here is that the righteous is because of his relationship with God. Again, it's not because we are just, that, that we are just righteous because we do it for ourselves. No, it's because of our total dependence upon God, our trust in God. And those that are trying to live life in this world, and they want to be happy, and they want to be successful, and they want to live a lot of years, and they want to enjoy the things of this life, but when they're not putting God at the center of their life, when they're not making God the number one influence and entity in their lives, then they come to this other part. That's just what it is. That's not popular to preach or teach. Because people are looking and say, well, you know what? He's pretty good. I understand. Us being over here in righteous, again, it's God's doing, but do we have to comply to God? The ungodly are not so. When you re-examine those first couple of verses, in contrast, the ungodly man, his happiness is temporary, never really satisfied. You see, the godly man comes to this point of pure satisfaction Satisfaction because it's a relationship with God every day, every day. Not so with the ungodly. The ungodly looks at the world and he looks at life and he just never is able to be satisfied. He can't do enough, he can't experience enough, he can't taste enough, he just can't, he can't get enough. And he's trying to do everything that he can to get all the gusto that he can in this life and he just can't find it fully. That's the ungodly. And you know what's going to be him? Just as Solomon expresses in his book of wisdom, in the book of Ecclesiastes, you talk about vanity and you talk about a chasing after the wind. That's all that it is. So when we look at his life and see what it is, that it's the opposite of this righteous individual, then we go back to the question, well, what regulates his life? And there we see that in the the other part of verse 4. Here's what regulates his life, the wind. The wind. Now he uses this, the psalmist uses this as a figure of speech, metaphorically. He says in 4b, the last part of verse 4, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now the righteous man, what regulates his life? God's law that he meditates day and night. But what's regulating the life of the ungodly man? The wind. Now I... Tease the San Joaquin Valley folks about their summers and heat over there. But I want to tell you what. 
I don't mind the fog, I don't mind the rain, but I don't like the wind. And we can have some wind here, can't we? And if it comes right off the ocean, it's like a cold that goes to the bone. We understand that. What is wind? It's this powerful, it's it's, this air that is moving, and we get this description that this man's life, it is controlled by the wind, but what does the wind represent? The wind here is not representing anything good. How sad he's being controlled by the wind. He's being controlled by worldly winds. He's being controlled by what the world offers. And you know why? Because in his, in his regulation, the reason why he's controlled by the wind is because he is so self-centered. Do any of us ever maybe have a problem with that from time to time? Self-centeredness? It's about me. What I want and what I like, what I think I need. I want to ask you to raise your hands because all that can understand that we probably all should raise our hands at least to that sometimes. Let's understand and appreciate what this fellow is all about. What's regulating his life. And so it's referred to even this chaff. Look at it again. But are like the chaff which the wind drives away. I want you to know right now chaff has no value. The chaff. If you're probably, I don't even want to say an age. If you're under a certain age, you may not even know what chaff is. But if, if you go out here and, and, and just say, first of all, and if we talk about taking wheat, and you take the wheat out of the field, and there's the chaff around the wheat, because what we're after, we're after that wheat kernel, that wheat germ that we can actually use to, to make the bread, to make meal and make bread. But we understand that there's some stuff around it and whatnot that has to be separated from the wheat, right? And what is it? It's chaff. It's chaff. And what value is it? It doesn't have any value. It's good only to be what? Burned, it says. You see, it has no profit, no substance. It's only good for burning. Jesus refers to this chaff concept in his teaching of Luke chapter 3, verse 17. And actually, this takes us really back to, to John the Baptist. I apologize, John the Baptist. And there we see that the winning, his winning fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barns, and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Chaff is always associated with something that doesn't have any real value or profit, but is something that's going to be left to be burned to judge, so to speak. How sad of what regulates the ungodly man's life. And my friends, why are so many driven by the wind? Because of a total lacking of faith. When we don't have true substantive faith, then we're going to let the the wind regulate our lives rather than our faith in God and his word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We're going to be regulated by the word of God, not by the wind. And it's a faith issue. James encouraged Christians in James 1. He commanded in verse 6, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sin, uh, sea, the wave of the sea driven and tossed by what? The wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. The unrighteous man is regulated by the whims of this world, the wind, if you will. Therefore, when we look at his life and ask the question, what regulates his life, there too are fruits. And that is seen in verse 5. The fruits of his life. Listen to it, verse 5 of the first psalm. Verse 5. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. We have such a figure of speech, such an idiomatic expression here, and I want to dispel something right off the bat here. When he says, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, do you suppose there might be some that say, oh, well, look at that right there. They're not going to be judged. Is that what the idiom is suggesting? No, 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 no. Fascinating word study. And when we look at its context, it becomes quite clear. First of all, this ungodly 
He is going to be a man that if he doesn't get and understand now, the time is coming that all of a sudden he will know what it means to be guilty and what it means to be an outcast. But the idiomatic expression that he, that the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment is simply saying that the guilty cannot stand in judgment from the standpoint because when they stand in judgment, they become almost as it were weak in their knees. Man, I can remember times as a young, young man, as a, as, a, as a boy, and there were times that I knew because of wrong behavior that I was going to have to stand before my father and he was going to ask some questions and he was going to get to the bottom of the matter. Now, did I know my guilt? Yes, I did. Did I understand that there were going to be repercussions of that? Without question. And I can remember times vividly. I'm standing before my father. And it's all coming to light. What's happened. And I'm getting weak in the knees. And I'm shaking. And I'm sweating. And I know what's coming. You see it wasn't a matter of me going up to my father. And standing strong and firm. And say yes dad you have something to say about this. Can you imagine that, Scott, before Papa Dow? <laughs> when it says that they will not stand in judgment, they're not, you see, we're going to be able to stand in judgment, and when we stand in judgment, what's the Lord going to say? Because we found righteousness in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He's going to say, come on in, enter in. We can stand. Not so with the ungodly. He is not in fellowship with the righteous. He's not in fellowship with God. The Apostle John wrote to Christians in 1 John 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from the beginning. That we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all our sins. The godly have that relationship, not so with the ungodly, and God will have no fellowship, no partnership or communion with sin. This is why Paul had to remind the Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, his last letter to the Thessalonians, and when there was some sinful behavior going on right in the congregation, and amongst those brethren in that congregation, remember what Paul stated, and it's a command in Second Thessalonians chapter three and verse six. He says, "But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is by His authority, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you received from us." You see, the ungodly are not going to be able to stand in judgment and even for those that had experienced what it meant to be godly and righteous in Jesus Christ, to defect from the faith, to walk away, there is going to be even for that individual an inability to truly stand. In fact, in verses 14 and 15 of the same opening in 2 Thessalonians 3, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Even herein we see the value, the importance and the love factor when it comes to church discipline. What a contrast. Two paths, two destinies, and the choice is always ours. It's always ours. We close with the last verse. Because the last verse, verse 6 of Psalm 1, is the Lord's accurate summation of it all. And by inspiration, the psalmist says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The way of the righteous leads to eternal life. The way of the ungodly leads to condemnation. And the choice is ours. The choice belongs to each and every one of us.
What is our choice? And which path are you on today? We're going to sing an invitation song. And the very message of this invitation song is simple. It's the way of the cross that leads home. The way of the cross. Have you come to the cross of Jesus Christ? Have you rendered full obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Your faith, your conviction, your genuine repentance of your past sins. Have you been buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins? Have you gotten on that path? We offer to you his invitation if we can help you with any spiritual need. Won't you come forward and let that be known at this time as we stand and sing the song that has been selected. Go on.